This is part two of my attempts at a higher and more stable voltage reading, and it takes me down the rabbit hole where only a retired R&D veteran with time on his hands would go, and why my wife goes nuts when it takes me a month to figure out what toaster we should buy. As noted prior, I think of electrical movement described as electron flow, electrons moving from the negative to positive. Conventional flow is described as the charge moving from positive to negative. In my experience, thinking of terms of electron flow often shows issues that are overlooked during design and that are poorly maintained. While investigating the negative or grounding points, the Ford diagram seemed off. Let's take a look at the positive side cabling from the driver's battery. The cable is sized larger on the diesel trucks. I presume it's because of the extra current the Fickham draws, since both gas and diesel are trailer tow capable. On the negative side, we have the cable off the passenger's negative terminal to the fender. The electrical sources are either the batteries or the alternator, depending on the operational state of the motor. And it's the body tub where our electronic components are attached to. So there's a pretty good disparity in the cable sizes. The negative size is 8, the positive 4, which is twice as large. At first glance, the differential in sizing looks worse than it is. Ford uses the frame as the negative side bus bar, with connections at the rear of the frame for all rear lights and trailer connections. This pathway is through the one aught negative battery cables and eliminates the 8-gauge cable, so some current is trafficked at those points by the frame. So let's figure the frame bus bar to rear is worth two cable sizes. On the gas motors, then we have parity negative to positive. The positive is 6 gauge, the negative is 8 gauge plus 2 gauge, equaling 6 gauge. If the diesel Fickham addition required a 2 gauge increase on the positive to 4 gauge, then the negative side should have been increased to 6 gauge. It wasn't. Of course we have two 12 gauge bonding cables cables that are supposed to be there for voltage equalization, and they don't show in the electrical diagrams as current flow elements. They do bridge between supply and demand, but they are there on the gas motors as well, so not to make up for any deficiency. I need to show these pictorials so you can better understand the rabbit hole I went deep into, especially from my electron flow perspective. This is our truck's layout looking from the cab, showing the main battery, the auxiliary battery as Ford calls it, the sheet metal tub as the ground plane, the cables connecting all, including the bonding cables. The dashed cable between the driver's frame rail and the engine block is my added cable for battery balance. The frame is always connected to both batteries, utilizing the short one aught cable between the engine block and passenger frame rail. With the factory cables, when we engage the starter, electrons move following these paths in blue. The main battery has a direct route to the engine block, shown light blue. The flow from the auxiliary battery in dark blue passes through the frame, then through the jumper cable between the frame and engine block. If you installed a jumper cable as I did to better balance the batteries, the pathway follows this. It's a shared flow. The continuing measurements and examples don't include any of this major negative flow in the battery cables, but it's important to understand what's happening. First, I need to document what the factory cable flows on the positive side. A cold start in the morning. A hot start in the afternoon. Notice the Fickham demand is lower.
next all accessories radio heated seats heater high Headlights, brake lights, windshield high, now to measure the negative side cable flow. I've included the two bonding cables which are highlighted. You know, the ones that Ford didn't include in their diagrams because they are only there for bonding. But I need to take a minute to explain how I collected and recorded these measurements. Using my iPhone and iPad I recorded the ammeters reading of each cable I was looking at. I then played back each video entering the measurement into an Excel spreadsheet table on a second by second basis. Every test of each situation was done at least twice, three times if a day's recording was a little too wonky. And each test was done in the same manner so the variables of battery charge, engine temp, etc. were all close as possible. The spreadsheet identified each recording by date, length, and variables. The stock cables after I had cleaned all the connections. I'll leave this real time. I wait to make sure the current flow has settled out before turning on the accessories for maximum demand. For all these tests, I'm using a Lee Snellville 230 amp alternator with an overdrive pulley to eliminate any alternator deficiencies while the glow plugs are on. So the bonding cables are not as passive as you may expect. During starting and during full accessory use, especially the lower bonding cable at the frame, the one that burned on my truck. At first I summed up all the current flow values and they added up higher than what I was measuring on the positive 4 gauge cable during warm up and starting. And what concerned me was the 50 plus amps flowing through the passenger battery 8 gauge jumper cable considering I had recorded only 21 amps flowing through the 4 gauge positive cable. With a close look at the ammeter's flow indicator, it became obvious that during the wait to start, starting, and running stages of operation, the current flow was changing direction. I expected all current flow would be towards the body tub and to the system harnesses. But the glow plug and starter demand does cause current to flow from the batteries, through the body tub, and then to the engine block. The hunger of those two devices, glow plugs and starter, will pull energy from anywhere they can. So I changed the values depending on the flow direction. I gave it the value of positive towards the electrical system harness, negative towards the glow plugs and starter. This may be a hard concept to follow, so I'll try it two ways. First is my pictorial from my electron flow perspective. Remember, this is in addition to the main battery cable's flow to the block. I detailed that earlier and not including it here. During the initial wait to start, glow plug warm up, electrons flow in these directions. Main battery 8 gauge cable to fender, 19.5 amps. Both batteries to frame, then through the bonding cable to the cab floor and tub. 1.5 amps. From the tub firewall through the 26 inch bonding cable to the engine block for the glow plugs. 5.5 amps. 
During starter engagement, flow is increased from the passenger battery 8 gauge cable to the fender and cab, over 50 amps. At the bonding cable under the floor, electron flow switches direction and now moves through the frame rail to the block, contributing to the glow plugs and starter, increasing in flow to around 10 amps. At the bonding cable from the firewall to the engine block, flow stays in the same direction, but it's increased to contribute to the glow plugs and starter, around 32 amps. The body tub is still trying to provide 18 to 20 amps for the FICM and the PCM. Current through the 8 gauge cable is increased by 30 amps, so the voltage drop will be higher within that 8 gauge cable. The more current flow through a wire, the more voltage drop. And that's the FICM supply voltage on the negative side. Remember, I'm an electron flow guy. The voltage drop values may not be all that much, but think of the concept. Now the engine is running and the alternator is supplying all of the electrons after the glow plug cycle. The flows change again. All electron flow is towards the truck's electronics and relatively balanced between the main battery 8 gauge cable and the two bonded cables. The total current flow is what is measured at the positive cable from the driver's battery to the power junction, about 20 amps. This balance changes when we turn on all the electronics in the cab. The flow direction is the same, and the flow of electrons is in proportion to each cable's calculated resistance. For the same 12 gauge bonding cables, the longer cable has more resistance. I'll repeat this in a graph format as I know I find it easier to understand, especially when comparing cable changes. And again, it's in terms of electron flow. When the key goes to wait to start, the FICM is drawing energy to move the spools, the buzz. So not only is that coming from the red 8 gauge line at the passenger battery, but the black bonding cable to the floor is also moving energy to the tub, the frame being the connection of both batteries. At the firewall, the blue cable is moving energy to the block due to glow plug demand supplementing what is already being supplied by the main cables. Once buzzing stops, flow is diminished, and as the glow plugs warm, the amps are reduced, and you can see that in the red 8 gauge cable supplementation. Once the starter is engaged, all hell breaks loose. The two bonding cables are flowing energy to the block, supplementing what is already done through the main cables. The blue firewall cable flow greatly increases. This puts a much higher demand on the red 8 gauge cable, way more than what the FICM and PCM are demanding. The higher the amp flow, the more voltage drop. After engine start, the cables settle into all flowing about the same amount to the body tub, supplying electronics. When all the accessories are turned on, with a demand of about 65 to 70 amps, the current flow is proportioned by each cable's resistance. This deviation between the cables is more pronounced due to the higher volume of current and shows how resistance can become a factor. It's the classic parallel resistor circuit. So for me, those bonding cables are utilized more as current flow cables than I expected or I'm comfortable with based on my history. As conductors, they will always flow current and they are needed to keep all grounds at the same electrical potential. They are more important than just bonding cables and I'm glad I went through the process of cleaning the connections. The big concern for me is that frame to floor bonding cable in the rust belt states. A braided cable which retains water and de-icing compounds and is often found corroded and occasionally burned into two pieces. I replaced mine initially with two 8 gauge cables after finding it burned. The classic fix something with a bigger something. And I'll go through the test that shows how that worked out. But for me, it exposed more issues with this vehicle layout than what I was expecting, especially since my goal was only to get more stable voltage. Sorry for the long video of examination. The next video follows the easy and inexpensive changes I looked for. Thanks for watching.